Hey, what's going on everybody? This is RobWillis.info here, and in this video I want to talk about setting up Grok filters for parsing IIS logs. Now, in some of my recent videos I covered everything about setting up the elk stack and getting it up and running, as well as ingesting local logs or uh, IIS logs from a local Windows server that was running on the same network. Now, one of the things you may have noticed about those logs is that the elk stack actually doesn't parse those individual fields out. It just pulls it in as a single message. So uh, let me go ahead and pull up some logs here and show you what I'm talking about. Alright, so I'm over here on the elk stack server, and uh, this is the same server that I used in the previous setup videos. But I'm going to build up my file beat search here, and I'm just going to remove all logs from the Linux host and only show the Windows host. Because uh, those are the only two machines that are actually sending logs over at the moment. Um, but here's an IIS log here. But notice that the uh, in the message field there is that the actual IIS log portion and it's not broken out at all it's just one big long string and now we can do searches against this string um, but it's a lot easier to uh, to do searches and build searches and kind of like really deep dive into analysis if you can break the individual fields out and then build your searches from there so for example let's take a look at one of the uh, the wind log beat logs because these should actually be parsed out because that's all built in and it should just do it automatically and uh, see, so notice here that it actually breaks out all of these individual fields here, like the keywords, the level, the uh, log name, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, let's let's find another one that has a little bit more of a message that's been broken out. Okay, so this is a good one here. So notice the uh, like the account name, the DWM dash one, and we see how it actually broke that field out as the target username. So now we can actually search for um, anything with that field that has the value of the DWM dash one. So you see by clicking the little plus magnifying glass that it adds that um, the field and that value to my search. And now that we see all results containing that. So by breaking out those fields, it makes it a lot easier to just quickly search through logs. And uh, so like it, on IIS logs, we could break it out by IP address and uh, or the SC status and stuff like that. And it really makes it a lot easier to search through the logs. All right, so one more thing I want to talk about before moving on is that you'll see all these available fields on the left-hand side. Now, those are only available because the logs were parsed out, um, but you can this can really help you narrow down the data and the, the what information you're seeing on the screen. Like, say, for example, I click on the event ID. If I add that, it'll show just a column of event IDs and nothing else. And you can still go back in the middle and expand the, uh, the full logout to see it. But, like, see here how it parsed out the event ID? So if I go up and I click on event ID, I could add it and show just the event IDs. Or if I click on it, it'll show me the top five event IDs that I'm seeing in the environment. So I can really kind of quickly narrow things down. And then if I click on the plus sign magnifying glass, it'll only show me uh, logs with that event ID. So as you can see, it's pretty important to have the individual fields broken out. Um, but with that all being said, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, IIS server and its configuration. All right, so let me give you a quick little demo of my uh, Windows Server and the IIS configuration here. Uh, so you'll notice on the left-hand side, I have two sites configured. I have test.local and site-2. And uh, let me show you the bindings real quick. So I have uh, an open binding, and then I have one on test.local for the test.local site. And then for site 2, I just have it um, bound to site-2.local. And uh, this is just to create two uh, simple sites just so we can create some logs and uh, get them adjusted into the stack. And uh, now the other, the most important part here is I'm going to click on the server level and I'm going to click on logging. And uh, I'm just going to uh, stick with all the defaults here except for with the field. So I'll, I'll do uh, one log per site, uh, leave it in the default directory, and uh, let me show you the fields here. So I went ahead and I selected every single field. So they're all enabled now. Now this part's important because the Grok filter is going to have to match up with all of these fields. So uh, like I said, I went through and just checked through, checked all of them and then uh, hit OK. All right, and uh, let me just pull up one of the logs to show you what that looks like real quick. And uh, so IIS saves them. It actually ties it to the service number. So if you click on sites, you'll see the uh, ID there. So site ID 2 is the uh, service 2. So site 2 is this log here. And I'm just going to go ahead and double click to uh, open the file. And you'll see that these are all the fields right here. Now, the Grok filter is going to have to match up with these ones exactly as they are in the order that they're in. Um, but so with all of the fields enabled, this is going to end up being a really long grog, uh, grog filter. Um, but yeah, so that's it. That's what a, a basic IIS log looks like. And those are the fields we're going to be trying to match. And uh, let me just pull up file beat real quick and show you that there is one uh, little uh, uh, tweak that we have to make to its configuration as well. 
So in FileBeat's root directory, I'm going to pull up the uh, FileBeat.yml configuration file. And uh, the configuration is basically the same as it was in the setup video, but you'll notice here that I've added the document underscore type colon IIS. And uh, this is important because when we set up the grok filter, we're going to say, hey, if it matches this type of IIS, then run the filter against it and parse out the log. So it's going to have to match our grok filter that we set up later on. So again, make sure you enable all of the uh, the logging fields in IIS, and then go ahead and add that document type IIS to your FileBeat configuration, and uh, make sure you restart the uh, FileBeat service after making those changes. And uh, that's it. So let's go ahead and head over to the Linux machine and add our Grok filter. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pull up a terminal real quick. And uh, if you watch my previous videos, you'll remember that I made a bunch of configuration files in Etsy log stash slash comp dot D. So I'm just going to go ahead and CD there. And uh, if I do an LS, you'll see that there's the configuration files that I previously made. So I'm just going to create a new one and add it into the same folder. So I'm just going to sudo nano and I'm going to name this one 11 dash IIS dash filter dot conf and I'm gonna hit enter to open that file. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy and paste my grok filter in here. And uh, you'll see that it's gonna be super lengthy, but um, it's just gonna say filter if type is IIS, and that's gonna match the document type that we set on the file beat configuration. And then from there, I'm just gonna do a grok match against the message field, and you'll see all the individual fields that match up against the IIS log. Uh, so if you're building one of these, it can get super lengthy and tedious, so it definitely helps to use some of the uh, online grok filter testers that are available, and uh, it can definitely save you some time on troubleshooting your, uh, your grok filter. Um, but I'll be making this one available for download from my website, and uh, links to that will all be down below. So you can just easily copy and paste the configuration and uh, edit it as you need. Um, so that's it. So I'm just going to save the file and exit the editor. And now I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, since I made changes to the Logstash configuration, I'm going to go ahead and restart Logstash so it picks up my, uh, my new configuration file. So I'll just do a sudo systemctl and uh, restart Logstash. And then I'm going to head back over to my Windows machine and create some logs because this filter is only going to work against new logs that are ingested by the server. It's not going to be applied to any old ones. So uh, let's head over there and generate some logs. And I'm just going to pull up a web browser real quick and uh, generate some logs, like I said. And I'm just browsing the sites locally in, in Chrome. And then I'm going to head back over to the Linux machine here. All right, so uh, back on our Kibana instance on the uh, Elk Stack server here, I'm gonna. Uh, so since we generated some new logs, I'm gonna go ahead and change my uh, time frame to the last uh, 15 minutes or so. So I'll just use the uh, the preset there, and then I'm actually gonna pull up a new tab and let's. Uh, I'm gonna browse to that site from this server to generate even more logs, and uh, it works because we have that open binding on the first site there, and uh, that's it. So we generated some more logs. We got our time frame set. And uh, so now I'll go ahead and um, I'll add, uh, let's do this by, what field do I want to use here? I'll do the uh, the beats host name and then show just logs from the Windows server again. So I'm just going to hit the uh, magnifying glass to add it to our search. And there we go. So there's logs from just the Windows machine. And we see that the, uh, the first log here that actually showed up looks like it is an IIS log. And uh, would you look at that? Nice. It actually parsed out all of the uh, individual fields from our log. So there you go, nice and neat. It completely broke up the IIS log, and now we can search by these individual fields from anything uh, like the host IP or the client IP, um, what type of request was it, what was the uh, URI that they requested, what was their user agent, all of that fun stuff. Oh, one thing I want to mention before I forget, if you notice a little yellow triangle right here, and these uh, the plus and minus signs are grayed out, it's uh, you actually need to add them to the index pattern. So if you click on management and index patterns, and then click on the uh, the index pattern, so in this case file beat, and then click refresh field list, and it'll pick up the new fields that have been added. You'll have to do this anytime you start parsing for new fields. All right, so let's head back over to the, uh, the discover tab now and get back to our searching. And uh, I'm just gonna pull up a log here real quick. But uh, again, we see that it parsed it all out completely. And you'll see all the fields like the client IP, the host, the method that was used, 
the user agent, all of that stuff. And we see all of those fields matching up on the left hand side here. So let's take a look at like client IP. So we see these are the top hosts that made requests against the web server, which is actually the web server itself and then the Linux machine. So when I made those few requests from over here, that's what we're seeing there. And uh, at this point, only two IPs have made, actually uh, made requests against the server in the last 15 minutes. Um, but then I can add that source IP and we see that these are all of the requests that were made from the Linux machine against that web server. So oftentimes, whenever you see a web server is being attacked, you'll see that uh, single IP addresses tend to generate a lot of 404 errors. So I'm going to add the SC status to my search here, and uh, I'm going to modify it. So instead of a 200 OK or a successful request, I'm going to change it to 404. So then it's going to show me 404 errors generated by that client IP address. And we see that it actually did already generate a few 404 errors. So let's just go ahead and expand the log real quick and see what was what was requested. Oh, and look at that. So it was the fave icon was requested and returned to 404 because there's not one on the default IIS website. One more thing I want to show before we wrap things up here is that uh, another thing that we can do that now that the uh, IIS logs are parsed out is we can view the logs by individual site in the IIS. So uh, the CS host field here should actually show it, but or is it the site name? No. Oh, it's because my uh, my search is limited down to uh, requests from the Linux machine. So let me go ahead and just uh, remove this real quick, and I'm just going to use the trash can. And let's also get rid of the 404, and then that should actually populate the CS host. See, I had the search limited down to what requests were made from that Linux machine, and it only hit the 86. Um, but now we see on the host field that it actually shows the site2.local, the test.local, and the uh, one bound to the IP address, because remember I have that open binding on the uh, test.local site. So now I can actually add one of these to my search and then search for logs only against that website and kind of go from there. So uh, that's another huge advantage of having the, uh, the logs parsed out like this. So now you could do per site analysis rather than per server and get a really good idea of what's going on in your environment and on each website that you're responsible for. And uh, I think that's pretty much going to be it. Um, Oh, you know, there is one more thing that I do want to mention. So if the Grok filter fails, there's a few ways to tell. So if you expand a message, one, it'll be obvious because it won't be parsed out. But two, if you scroll down to where it says tags, notice how it says beats input codec plane applied. You would also see after that it would say comma Grok parse failure. And that's how you know that the uh, filter didn't exactly line up with the message and it wasn't applied. And from there, it's usually just a very manual process of taking some of your logs, taking your filter, and running it through some of the online testers and, and adjusting your filter as needed and making sure it lines up with a good solid match. And I think that's where I'm going to wrap this one up. I uh, really hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I thank you for watching. I know I sure had a good time messing around with this elk stack here and uh, getting all these different kinds of logs ingested. Um, I'll probably be doing some more videos on it in the future, so if you guys are into that kind of thing and you want to see more, let me know in the comments down below. If you liked the video, make sure you give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, thanks for watching.